Hello and welcome to Day Talks Live. My name is Natalie Turvey and I'm President and Executive Director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. It's our 30th year here at the CJF and we are very proud of our rich history supporting and celebrating excellence in journalism. During this pandemic and in an age of misinformation, we are all witness to why truth matters more than ever. Every year, the CJF celebrates those who seek the truth and those who show great promise as future truth seekers with our awards and fellowships program. We hope there's something for everyone from our new Black Journalism Fellowships, which aim to amplify Black voices and stories, to our Lifetime Achievement Award, where you can nominate the Canadian whose career reflects an exceptional contribution to journalism. There are also awards for local and national excellence, photojournalism, digital innovation, and journalists shedding light on women's equality issues. Our awards open in January, and you can visit our website for details. We're thrilled you've joined us for our Day Talks Live as we explore pressing and topical media issues. This event is possible thanks to our exclusive Day Talks series sponsor, TD Bank Group. Thanks also to in-kind supporters, CPAC Incision, and a heartfelt thank you to our fabulous series host, Anna Maria Tremonti. We have been honored to have her lead this season of Timely Talks. A reminder that if you'd like to tweet about this conversation, the hashtag is JTalksLive. The pandemic is taking a psychological toll on many of us. Today, we look at how COVID-19 is affecting the mental health and well-being of the journalists who are tasked with covering this fast-moving, unrelenting story, thanks to a global study conducted by today's guests. Dr. Anthony Feinstein is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto and a global authority on how journalists are impacted by the traumatic events they cover. And Mira Selva is director of the Journalist Fellowship Program at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University, where our own CJF Chair, Kathy English, is currently a Journalism Fellow. If you have questions for our guests, feel free to submit them anytime using the questions tab on your screen, and we'll make sure they get to our host. Thank you for joining us this season, and we look forward to sharing our lineup for 2021 in the coming weeks. And now, over to Anna Maria Tremonti. Hello, everyone, and welcome, Anthony and Mira. We have um, lots to talk about, so I'll get right to it. And um, I want to start by maybe having one of you just give me a few quick numbers that encapsulate what you've discovered about the vulnerability of journalists covering this epidemic, pandemic. Yeah, so thanks, Anna Maria. Um, so the numbers are these. The prevailing emotional um, problem is one of anxiety affecting 25% of the journalists whom we studied. That's very high. The rates of depression are 20%. And in fact, the overall level of emotional distress, psychological distress, is in excess of 80%. Um, very compelling numbers, and uh, I want to dig deep into them. But let's start by um, Mira. The, what were you seeing amongst journalists that made you contact Anthony Feinstein to begin with to really look at this and, and go into the weeds? No, I contacted Dr. Feinstein in late spring, so after the pandemic started, but when we were still in the very early stages, because what I was seeing was utter confusion. We saw journalists like everybody else being suddenly told to work from home, and what we were also seeing is that the front line of journalism had changed. So the other area I look at is press freedom, where we look at the dangerous journalists go face when they go into war zones, when they go to cover um, potentially dangerous situations. And what we found here is that everybody is covering a potentially dangerous situation without really knowing if they themselves are vulnerable, without having the network and the support of the newsrooms that they normally have, without having protective equipment that they would normally be given. You would normally be given a flat jacket if you go into, into a war zone. So we found that journalists were trying to do their job, cover the biggest story of our age in many ways, without any guidelines. And they were under tremendous pressure. And what we were also finding is deep concern from newsrooms, from editors and organize, media organizations about their staff. They were worried that they couldn't see them, couldn't speak to them directly. They knew they were asking a lot of them, but weren't quite sure what they were asking and what impact it was having. So we thought we'd try and unpick this a little bit. So Anthony Feinstein, take us through what you did and with whom. So um, when Mira approached me, um, we realized that we had to move quickly. Um, 
we wanted to capture as much data as we could without delaying. As you probably know, academia moves very slowly, um, glacial pace compared to the media. Um, but you know, with the COVID, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic being so um, so pressing, the ethics board at our university, my hospital, moved very quickly. We got ethics permission within a couple of days. I have a standout um, PhD student who could uh, develop a website to collect data. Mira was able to. Um, get two large international news organizations involved. They wanted to be part of the study. And so we very quickly collected data looking at the journalist's psychological well-being. And the first observation is that um, the response rate was really excellent. Two thirds of the journalists whom we approached wanted to take part. And this is a very high response rate for this kind of work. And that's an important observation because it says that the data we collected are likely representative of a broader group of journalists. So we can extrapolate from that. And then we use tried and tested methodology that we've used in previous studies to look at clinically significant anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a marker of overall psychological distress. And as I mentioned earlier, the predominant emotion amongst journalists is anxiety. Um, so 25% of our sample show symptoms of clinically significant anxiety. And uh, I just want to go, you, you mentioned two major news organizations. Are, are you able to name them? No, we're not, because this is a sensitive topic. So we guaranteed anonymity to the organizations and to all participants. And uh, can you tell us, uh, their journalists, um, how many countries um, were, were, are we talking about in terms of the survey of, of the journalists with these large news organizations? Vera, would you? Would you um, I, again, literally, we're breaking down the number of countries. What I can say is that it's a global survey, but what we asked were participants who had reported directly on COVID-19 and the survey was sent out in English. So it had to be people who um, had a good command of the English language. But in terms of the responses, they were from all the continents, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Asia, from North America, Europe. Okay, um, so I want to I want to dig down deeper into those uh, earlier numbers you used, Anthony. But first of all, as well, um, you usually do this after the fact, like you've looked at things once journalists come home. But yes. this time they're in the thick of it all. It's it's like real time survey. This is have you done that before? No, that's unusual. I mean, it's it's, it's a great point. I mean, you know, when, when Mira contacted me, we realized that we had to move quickly because this is an evolving story. And so the data that we collected really uh, was at the height of the pandemic during the spring, late April, early May, when you know emergency rooms in New York City were kind of overflowing, and there was a real acuity to the the, the medical issues. And so, take us through um, what uh, what you found most concerning and most surprising. You again, you touched briefly on those numbers of anxiety, depression, and emotional distress, but tell me more. So you know, you know, these were journalists who were um, all, you know, all covering the COVID story in various various forms. Um, many of them were like frontline journalists. They were going to hospitals. They were um, in the waiting rooms in the emergency department. Some were even invited into intensive care units. They were interviewing people who had survived the pandemic or the relatives of you know those who had lost people in the pandemic. So there was a real acuity to to what they were doing, and because. They were so close at times to you know where the infections were most prominent like in hospitals they were at risk themselves so they realized that and we think that can explain in part why the rates of anxiety are high so you know 25 percent prevalence rates so a point prevalence this is a moment in time in which 25 percent of our sample were anxious um, this is a figure that overlaps with the data that's been collected from first responders during the pandemic doctors and nurses and health specialists. So there's a real similarity in this data. And the rates of depression at 20% are also very high. This is, a, you know, this, is a, this is a shot in time. This is not a lifetime prevalence. This is a moment in time in which we look at your emotional state and to find 20% of our sample, one in five journalists had clinically significant depression is very high as well. And you often see depression overlapping with anxiety. So we get this comorbidity, which from a clinical perspective, makes it you know harder to treat so those that you know those were the standout um psychological data but there was some optimistic data as well which was 
these news organizations were offering therapy to the journalists. And that's a sea change in attitude compared to where the field was years back. And 52% of our sample were actually using the therapy. And a graphic example of how therapy works is that those, in, those journalists who were receiving psychotherapy had less anxiety, less depression, and less overall psychological distress, significantly less. And so, you know, no surprise, therapy helps. It makes a difference. And we see this here in real time. And so um, also, if you can identify that you need, that you are feeling these things and you can get therapy right away, as opposed to waiting until like two years from now, when, you know, the vaccine is supposedly out there for everybody, and then you get therapy. There, there's something to be said right there, huh? No, no, exactly. Like anything in medicine, you know, the earlier you intervene, the better the result. It's almost got like a preventative aspect to it, stopping problems getting worse. You know, when we get an infection, you don't wait for full-blown pneumonia. You want to get in early to treat the infection. And it's the same with psychological difficulties, that early intervention makes a very real difference. Were you able to look at um, journalist responses along racial lines? No, we didn't unfortunately collect that data. Um, and it's something that I haven't done over the course of my career. There was a pushback earlier on many years back about collecting this kind of data, but I think that's a great question. We just don't have it. And I don't know whether Mira has any anecdotal evidence to answer this question. Um, it's hard to tell because we did, um, because these are international, organizations, a lot of the people who are black or Asian are working in their countries of origin. They're not necessarily working in minor, you know, in countries where they're the minority. So you don't get the same kind of pressures um, that you get in, in, you know, when you look at kind of the situation amongst black journalists in British newsrooms, for example, where I think they, they feel more under pressure and more isolated. So that's not what we were looking at here. Um, what we did find, though, was that there was quite a lot of anxiety amongst journalists working in countries where they couldn't access accurate information, where they felt they didn't have the kind of uh, ability to report with, um, with accuracy and report openly, where they were working in kind of areas of, with high, high levels of censorship. And they felt there that they were, they were failing at their roles somehow. And um, Professor Feinstein talks a great deal about moral injury. And I think that's absolutely what we did see here, that journalists in some areas and some countries feeling that they couldn't do the job that they wanted to do because the conditions they were operating were virtually impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Anthony Feinstein, tell me a little bit more about what the numbers showed on that front. I mean, that's such a great question because we came across this repeatedly that many journalists felt that they were just falling short in their work. I mean, the sense was there was so much to do. There were so many stories. The, the workload was so high that no matter how hard they tried, there was always something else left to be done. And many journalists took that personally. They saw that as a failing on their part, that somehow they hadn't um, passed muster, that they weren't functioning at a level that they should, simply because they were being overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of what was being asked of them. And that, that, you know, that was turned inwards. They, many of them regarded that as a sense of somehow failure, of a moral failure, that I haven't, I haven't done what I should be doing at this moment, at this critical moment in society, somehow I've fallen short. And that, you know, and that was a false, that was a false belief, a false perception, which we tried to point out to them. Um, it really was a reflection on them simply being overwhelmed by the magnitude of the task at hand. And I wonder if you can also speak a little bit to the fact that, um, I, unlike again uh, earlier things with conflict, um, where often you the majority of reporters to whom you're talking have gone in and can get out, um, these would have been reporters, I guess, who are are they're, they're working from home, they're in their home cities, and how does that affect like that? There's nowhere to go. How does that affect some of what you saw? You know, we, we didn't have the methodology or the time to tease out exactly what factors were causing what, but I'm absolutely sure you're right, because it wasn't just the workload or the worry about you know, infecting yourself and bringing the infection home. But yes, the bureaus were closed. There was no support from colleagues. People were working in, uh, at home. The children were at home. The spouses were at home. The whole home situation was, you know, so different from what it had been in the past. There was uncertainties about um, resources. So there were multiple things that coalesced very quickly to make this an extremely stressful time for people. And I've no doubt that contributed to the anxiety. 
just as we see in society, you know, society at large. I mean, your know, data is now coming in from the general population, which is what is the predominant emotion in the broader society? And the answer is it's anxiety. People are just so anxious about all these things, all these aspects of their life that they've lost control over with a complete um, uncertainty as to when is it going to end? When will this, you know, there's, there's no finite end. You can't say this is going to end tomorrow or in a week or two. And that contributes to the anxiety as well, this uncertainty. So uh, Anthony Feinstein, when you saw these numbers coming in, given all the other work you've done on journalists um, in trauma and covering trauma, what was going through your head? How did you react to this? Well, you know, in some ways, I wasn't that surprised by the, by the high level of distress because I, I see this in my day-to-day -day work. I mean, there's another way of looking at it, of course, is that you know, the majority of journalists don't show these difficulties, but still 25% of anxiety is a very high number. Um, you know, that, that, that's a worry, that's a concern, but unlike some of my earlier research, at least in this, in this instance, these journalists were getting help. You know, there was therapy available to them. I mean, this is a sea change in attitudes. I mean, I've done so many studies in the past in which journalists were not getting help. So much of my work with freelancers shows there's no help available to them. And here we've got a sample, a large sample of journalists, you know, with big news organizations, and they were being told, here's yeah, psychotherapy, use it if you want. You know, and 52% of the group were making use of that, which is a very impressive number. And so, you know, the worry aspects of the pandemic were to a degree offset, at least in this instance, by these journalists having access to help. Mira, you wanted to jump in there. I just wanted to talk about the pressures of journalists and, and similar to the wider population. What you also saw there was the role of women. So we've had a lot of data now about how the pandemic has affected women disproportionately, both in terms of their income levels, but also time poverty that most of the extra domestic duties of caring for children at home from school and so on have fallen on women. And what we saw there was that more women than men responded to the survey and also um, more women were showing signs of kind of PTSD, anxiety and depression compared to, compared to the men, which is tallies with what we saw in wider society as well. I just want to remind those of you watching, if you want to submit questions, please feel free to do so as we continue our conversation. Um, Mira Selva, um, you have now or since been doing as well a survey of newsroom managers on this issue. What are you finding? Well, this is, this is not my survey. It's done by my colleagues at the Reuters Institute. And what they're finding, and this is a survey that was done after our study, and what we're finding is that newsroom managers now accept that this is reality. So when we did the study, we were looking at a moment in time with the assumption that it's a crisis and how do we deal with the crisis? But with, in the back of our mind, an idea that it'll go back to normal and what we need to do is protect people and look after them until normality returns. And what the recent surveys of newsroom managers is showing is that actually now newsroom sub managers are beginning to accept that the new normal will be some kind of hybrid newsroom with people working from home part of the time, people working in the office half the time. There's going to be a lot of layoffs in the industry. That's one thing that's really quite clear. So some of the pressures that journalists were under at the time of that survey are just going to stay. The lack of networks, the lack of job security in some way, the, the sense of moral injury, the sense of not always being able to do the job to the best of their abilities because of factors around them. I think some of these things are going to be here to stay and responsible editors are going to recognise and do recognise, to be fair, that this is going to have an impact on the emotional well-being of their staff in a way that it hasn't before. And, you know, you just you make the point that um, uh, layoffs um, are also a part of this. So do you see um, a willingness amongst managers to fight for the resources they're going to need to take care of those journalists who are not laid off? Or are they going to end up having to say, sorry, we can't cover your counseling. We can't provide you these research resources. We had cutbacks. I don't know is the answer. I mean, it'd be yeah. nice to say, I, I do think, I do genuinely believe that there are, there's a generation of editors that recognizes this problem and takes their responsibilities seriously. But if the money's not there, the money's not there. 
Um, what I've found from other surveys that I've done on issues of press freedom in Central and East Europe is some of the things that help can be free. So a lot of journalists who feel attacked, who feel under pressure, talk about the strength they get from a sense of solidarity, from support from other journalists, just messages of support, community spaces where they can talk to each other. So these are not as effective as therapy, I think, but they are something and they can do a lot of good and stop people feeling like they're alone and stop people falling through the cracks. Um, Anthony Feinstein, did you notice a difference in those journalists who were in uh, non-Western countries in how um, they responded in terms of their levels of, of mental health concerns and in what was available to them? Yeah, we couldn't look at that. So, um, you know, it, it, we just didn't know where these journalists were in terms of their their, their geographical location. I think my prediction is this will have a very real impact on, on the, the provision of resources. Though interestingly enough, during the pandemic, we're all working virtually now. And so, you know, my entire clinical practice is virtual, which means that in theory, I could see someone wherever they are, you know, they don't have to come to my office. And so this kind of potentially frees up the reach of being able to get therapy to people. And um, you talk about the importance of that therapy, and um, and we know that it's you know it, it's available in varying degrees depending on who you're working for. But you have a tip sheet, Anthony, on on um, maybe how to try to move forward, and we're going to make it available on the CJF site. But do you want to take me through some of the some of the areas where you see um, journalists can help themselves or help each other? Yeah, so I'll try and summarize it quickly, but you know, one of the challenges that people face in general, but also journalists, of course, is that you've lost control of so many things. And so my message is try not to focus on those things that you can't control. You, know, you can't control the pandemic or the mortality rate or the economic news or the stock market. You can't control the behavior of fellow citizens. If you focus on that repeatedly, you use up your resources of emotion. You've got to focus elsewhere. And so put your energies into those things that you can control. And they're small, but when you add them up cumulatively, they make a difference. And so look after your sleep. Try and step back from the intensity of the news story. And I'll come to that in a moment. Watch what you eat, because people tend to comfort eat when they're feeling stressed. Devote a little bit of time to exercise. If you haven't exercised in the past, start doing it now. Most importantly, devote time and energy to your relationships. Stay in contact with people with all the social distancing and with bureaus closed, you've lost that now. And so make a concerted effort to put time into maintaining these social contact because they are protective from a mental health perspective. And then for me, the cardboard issue is this, and I picked this up from a letter to the editor of the New Yorker. A, a woman wrote in stating, at a time like this, you need respite as a form of resilience. And I think that's key. This, you know, respite as a form of resilience has become my mantra to, to, to journalists and my patients. In other words, step back from the intensity of the moment and look after yourself. Put into place in your day-to-day -day life those moments that nourish you, whether it's going for a walk or listening to music or doing exercise or maintaining contact with people. Um, Mindfulness-based therapy can be so important and helpful at a time like this. But have your moments of respite because you're in this for the long haul. You need your endurance. And if you don't focus on yourself, and journalists are very bad at this, they have this tremendous work ethic, they just go, 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 but they tend to neglect themselves in the midst of all of this. If you don't focus on yourself, you run the risk of burnout and using up your finite resources of emotional energy. And so this is a message that I put across time and time again, and it resonates. It really does resonate with people. If you can, from day to day, alter your life in such a way that you build in these brief moments of respite, you start feeling better. And Mira, uh, back to the managers, what's the manager's role in um, creating space to do that at a time when there's such a demand for, you know, people to be like filing again and again, mm -hmm. and, you know, and some of that, you know, but what, what Anthony's talking about butts right up against smaller staffs, greater workloads. Well, and I think part of a wider question of what does a media organization do if you're a newspaper with a website. There was a 
moment in time when people thought you have to file everything all the time and just fill, keep on going and keep on going and provide 24 hour news updates and write about every single thing that comes across your path. And because the website is infinite, you know, there's infinite space to fill. Now, putting aside the pandemic and mental health and work life balance, it was found that this is really ineffective. The readers and the viewers were switching off. Most stories were unread. Most things were not getting any kind of views. So it's basically a waste of time. And I think it's really important now that newsroom editors really think about what they're asking of their staff. Is this important? Does this need to be done? If, not, if it does not need to be done, can I just tell them to take the day off or finish early rather than fill, fill a gap on a, on a page that's probably never going to actually be read by anyone? So I think really focus on what's key and what's important. And that's important for the mental health of the staff, but actually for the future of the brand as well. And Anthony, one of the things you've got on your tip sheet, ask for help or therapy if necessary. Mm -hmm. Like like put up your hand and say essentially i need some help here don't be afraid to do that yeah that's so important because what i've what i've seen with journalists is they frequently say to me you know what right do i have to complain and the people that i'm reporting on have it so much worse than i do and so there's almost a sense of guilt if they admit to feeling this way um they kind of put themselves out of the picture and that you know that's that that's a that's a false belief system it's one that stops you getting Help. I mean, my, my message to that is, you know, if you break a leg and you go into the emergency room and the person in the bed next to you has broken two legs, do you get up and hobble out? Of course not. You stay there and you get your treatment. And it's the same with mental health issues that, you know, what you may be feeling could be a lot or will be a lot less than someone who's lost a relative from this. But it doesn't negate your own emotions. It doesn't mean that your feelings are not legitimate. And so if you're distressed by it, and your distress is affecting your relationships or impeding your ability to work. And those are two, those are two you know, markers for me. If your emotional difficulties are impeding your relationships and your, your ability to work, reach out for help because it makes a very, very real difference. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, how uh, journalists can manage other people's anxieties as they go through their reporting. I mean, you make the point that this really mirrors what's going on in society. Um, we see angry anti-mask demonstrations. We've seen all sorts of things where journalists are confronted, not just in the United States, in Canada and elsewhere. Um, so not only are they walking into places where they could be infected and they put themselves at health risk, but they're also walking into situations where they can be verbally abused or, or physically um, put at risk. How do you manage the anger and the, the anxiety of the people you're trying to cover? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the bottom line is that you can't. It's too big. And I think if journalists try and take on that role, they're going to get themselves into difficulties. I think they have to recognize that there's so many emotions out there with so many people, they can't manage that. I mean, my profession can't manage that. This has to play out in many different ways. What journalists should do is focus on themselves and on their colleagues and offer support. I think we know at a time like this that acts of altruism are actually you know, helpful. They're helpful to the person who receives it, but also to the person who's giving it. And so one of my messages has been, you know, look out for other people. You know, stay in touch with your neighbors. Don't lose touch with your, with your parents and your elderly parents. Maintain these contacts. Give emotionally to these people as well, because that's helpful to you. It's helpful for you to behave in this way. But when it comes to dealing with all these forces that are swirling around in society right now, record them, note them, document them, try and understand the causes, but don't try and change it because you won't. Mira, have you got thoughts on that one? It, it's the million dollar question, which is how do we deal with polarization? And again, part of the reason journalists are under such strain and in, in their mental health is because they are being accused of being peddlers of fake news, of lying, of being sellouts, of being, you know, machines of propaganda. They, they're having all these accusations hurled at them, you know, accused of being liars, which hurts when your entire profession is about telling the truth. That's what you kind of go into the profession for. So it's a very personal attack. And then the other part of this is um, a wider thing of there is a there is a kind of concerns about 
mob, you know, mobs turning on journalists in a way that they haven't before. So in Mexico with the earthquake, for example, a lot of journalists, Mexican journalists and foreign um, correspondents in Mexico really spoke about the anger of the people affected by the earthquake felt towards the journalists, how they felt that they were being exploited and felt that they were muscling in on grief. And the journalists themselves who'd gone to report were really shocked at that kind of anger that was thrown at them from the people they thought they were trying to help by reporting on. So I think this is a huge question. It's not something that's kind of solved, certainly as Anthony said, it's not solved easily um, and certainly not by kind of psychiatrists or therapists I think but there's a wider question of how the how politicians speak about the media how they whip up hatred against journalists how how media organizations speak against each other so I think you, if you create a climate where you're briefing against each other you're weaponizing people's kind of inherent beliefs and turning it against your colleagues so I think this is all it's the responsibility of the whole of society to really step back and say, stop, because ultimately this is going to damage everybody. But it's, a, it's an absolutely massive problem. And this is, you know, the, the emotional distress that it causes is, is just one manifestation of it. Yeah. Which uh, goes back to uh, what Anthony is saying in some of his, on his tip sheets there, you have to be mindful of this. You have to understand that you're walking into that and um, you need to find a way to protect yourself so that it, you know, even in your own mind, what you're, what you're thinking of when you're there and when you pull away, right? Like mm -hmm. when you actually just get out of the way too, you have to be mindful of how that crowd is maybe reacting to you or something, okay. and the even other though form, it's got nothing to do with you, you know? Yeah. And the other form of attacks are the, is the online trolling, which again, a lot of uh, female journalists are really susceptible to, um, that they get, they're the targets of very vicious, highly sexualized, um, attacks online which are incredibly distressing and again there's some things that the kind of technology companies can do there's something that the editors can do and there's something colleagues can do which is offer support because these are attacks that come into your screen and no one else sees so and so they really get to you um, so just being aware that this is a this is an issue this is a problem it's not something you have to cope with it's not something you just have to put up with but you can seek help and you, crucially you can switch off you can switch off social media and say, I just, I'm just not engaging with it right now. And it's important to give yourself permission to do that. I want to go to some questions. I've got one from uh, Jennifer Callahan who asks, is there any difference between the way male and female reporters deal with these stresses? Hmm. Hmm. That, 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 that's a really good question. I don't know, um, to be honest, we do know, and Mira touched on it earlier, that women report a lot more distress than men. We've got this in our study, that more anxiety, more overall psychological distress and more depression. Um, whether they deal with it differently within the journalism community, I don't know. Um, there's some literature that says in general psychiatry that women are more open to receiving therapy than men. Um, but I don't know how this plays out with respect to, to the journalists. It's a great question, I don't know. Um, she also asks, are there online support mechanisms in place? Are there places we can go online to find help? The DART Center um, offers resources for journalists and the Rory Peck Trust offers a lot of support for freelance journalists in particular who aren't covered in our study, but are very much um, people that we are aware are under these pressures yeah. and might not receive the support they need. There's also some really good online resources for apps like mindfulness based apps, which, you know, mindfulness is such an effective therapy for dealing with anxiety and stress reduction. And um, you could just, you know, do a quick search and see what they are, but those apps can be quite effective. I'm glad you mentioned as well, uh, like when you said the Rory Peck Trust um, for freelance journalists, because there's a couple of questions on that as well. Um, you know, as some uh, Lily Ryan is asking, you know, small local newspapers often work harder, longer with fewer resources than big corporate media in a time of crisis. The resulting mental health trauma is long lasting. How to help remain relevant and active as a crisis like COVID progresses with limited resources? What so if you're, um, I'll get to freelancers too, but that's like, if you have limited resources, are there things you should think about um, that you should maybe tackle first so that you can at least get something moving? Yeah. 
I would have thought exactly all the things that are on the tip sheet. Look after yourself, look after your diet, make time for rest and respite. You're not superhuman and making it, being a journalist does not require you to override kind of human, your human nature, which requires these things. That's a good reminder. <laughs> and also, uh, I should just let everybody watching know that we will, um, we're going to put that tip sheet on, um, on the CJF site, on the event site, along with um, the study that Mira's colleagues have done on uh, newsroom managers, just so that you can take a better look at what's being um, said and how things have been answered. Um, uh, again, uh, some other questions here. I'm just going to go to uh, another question here. Um, this is from Gayla Bard David or Bard David. Um, how do these figures for anxiety and depression compare with the general population during that same period of time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, these data overlap, as I say, with first responders, but there's also some data coming out now showing of showing elevated rates of depression and anxiety within the general population. Also, rates that are quite high. Comparisons here are slightly more problematic because a lot of the earlier data came out from countries like China, and you have to be careful of cultural comparisons. And you know, culture can be a very powerful modifier of the way people respond. But there's no doubt that rates of anxiety and depression are much higher within the general population. Whether they quite reach what they are in journalists and first responders, I think, is doubtful. But there's no doubt that people are anxious and worried now. Yeah, there's one figure that jumped out at me from our study, which was that over 80% of our sample reported just a general sense of psychological distress and Ill, you know, being ill at ease. And, and that's a very high figure. I mean, we've got good data within the general population as to what that figure is. It runs at about 30% within the general population. And so, you know, you could, I think, cautiously say that within the journalism community, it's about twice that. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about this before. Again, the, the earlier studies were about conflict zones, um, war and conflict about, um, you know, you need your flak jacket, not, not your N95. Um, and so I'm wondering how what you see compares to the more traditional sense of conflict. Are you, you see increases right now as well? Well, you see a different pattern of difficulties. I mean, you know, the war journalism data was very much focused on post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's much less of an issue now. I mean, you know, uh, you're not seeing uh, like an epidemic of PTSD as it were, although certainly the rates of PTSD are elevated. So I think from a, from a, from a descriptive perspective, it's, it's a different kind of, of problem right now. Now it's predominantly anxiety and worry with, with depression. In the war journalism group, it was you know, quite firmly post-traumatic stress disorder because you're confronting you know, war and the, and the risks of getting killed and seeing you know, people dying in front of you. So I think it's a different, it's a different spectrum of, of, of mental illness, but all of it is linked by psychological distress. These are all distressing phenomena. And so the rates are high. I'm also re you know, reassured by one other thing. You know, we collected a lot of data after 9-11 in New York where we found high rates of distress in journalists immediately after 9-11. But you know, I followed that group for a year after that, and I saw the rates progressively come down. So that one year after 9-11, journalists, and from a psychological perspective, had returned to their baseline. And you know, that's you know, that's that's my hope over here. I mean, there's so much uncertainty over the future. But with the passage of time, and as we start coming out of the pandemic, and the pandemic will end, and the threat starts going away going to be my prediction that you're going to see a, a steep decline in these levels of emotional difficulty. The worrying aspect is those journalists who are vulnerable, those who come with a past history of psychiatric difficulties, etc. How are they going to come out of this very difficult set of circumstances? And that's where the worry needs to, that's where the worry will be. Well, and it's interesting too, um, because um, you, uh, the pandemic will absolutely end, but um, uh, it will also change things permanently in some ways that we have not been able to predict. Yeah. And journalists will be covering that and be affected by that as well. And so, um, I mean, I'm guessing you're saying that, that these things that we can learn now, we also have to hang on to when, even when this pandemic is over, because the, the kinds of things that will need to be covered and the kinds of stresses are still going to be there. They're just going to change a bit. Correct. And the kind of tips that I put on the sheet that you have 
are going to be applicable at all stages in the story. You know, they're relevant now, but they're going to be relevant down the road as well. They're just useful tips about how we how we lead our lives. Uh, another question here. Um, this is um, very specifically Canadian, but I think we can talk about it in a wider uh, thing too. Cheryl Bird is asking if there's support through an association for freelance journalists for things like counseling or therapy um, because they're not covered under health plans. Um, is there something similar to health plans actors have? Um, I, if you're a freelance journalist and you, you mentioned, you know, the, the Rory Peck Trust in, in Britain, um, you know, but if you are, what are some ways, and we have organizations here that the CAJ, um, the Canadian Media Guild, that maybe you can reach out to as well, but people are already working in isolation. Freelance journalists tend to work in even greater isolation. What kinds of thoughts do you have for them? I think networks help. So I think online networks when you can't have in-person networks, but even if you can kind of monthly meetings, monthly calls, a sense of the fact that there are people you can reach out to and share resources and just talk to without, you know, to have a sense that you're not alone. And also a recognition that the pressures on freelancers are multi-layered. So there's financial pressures, there's unpredictability over the, the way you manage your time. I mean, if, if kind of daily news reporters have it tough, freelancers have it really tough because it's really hard to say no to a job, even if you're working on three different jobs because you, you know, it's a feast or famine situation very often. And also crucially, um, I think editors have a, who commission freelancers have a responsibility to make sure they afford them the same care they would afford their staffers. So if you wouldn't send your staffer out to cover a protest because it's dangerous, don't get rounded by hiring a freelancer and sending them out there. If you send someone, you've got to look after them. And I think this is a kind of way of thinking you've got to really think about. And the same goes for trauma. If you're sending freelancers into traumatic events or asking them to cover traumatic stories, you need to make sure they have access to support for the fallout. And uh, Anthony, I asked you earlier about some uh, racial differences in this survey, and you said that um, you couldn't go there. Um, how do you think, uh, you know, what we're going through now in wider society and inside in newsrooms, in journalism, with, with the, the issue of, of Black, Indigenous, people of color as journalists, as journalists, how do you think that the surveys will be able to change to pinpoint that um, when you're doing these scientific surveys where you haven't been able to do that? You know, we just have to ask different questions. Um, with, this, with this study, we moved very quickly. We just focused on, you know, let's get as fast as we can and collect as much data as quickly as we can. And we have to be so careful of not overloading journalists with lengthy questionnaires because they just won't do it. So we stay very targeted in you're smiling. Um, it's quite hard to collect this data. We have to go back with repeated reminders. But if we ask too much, we're just not going to get it done. But your point is so well taken because I think undoubtedly these are major factors that are present in our society right now, which are causing a lot of distress. And there are ways to tease it out. We just have to have a different focus, a different inflection to our questions that we can get at some of these data. So um, we just have a few minutes. So before we wrap up, maybe um, now that the two of you have collaborated on this and you've got some really important information moving forward on how journalists um, are vulnerable and how they might actually try to mitigate some of this, I'm wondering, you know, the more questions you ask, the more questions you get. So I'm wondering for each of you, what questions do you have now moving forward as you, you watch journalists trying to cover a pandemic and um, like, what are you thinking about what, what kinds of questions hang with you? Mira, do you want to start? I really want to ask journalists now, what do you need? What have you been given that works? What do you think you would like? Because I think journalists have a clearer idea of that now than they did at the time of this survey. I think we all do really, we all know, um, you know, what, what we need. So I would like to be able to ask journalists that. And is it that you want more time? Is it that you want some recognition of the fact that you're working at your kitchen table and there might be a small child or a puppy coming up. Do you, do you need different assignments? Because for a long time, this has been the only story in town. And one other data point on this is like, 
um, I think for only 4% of our respondents were specialist health reporters to begin with, but now 74% say they're reporting on health related matters. So, you know, 74% of people are suddenly like writing about things and 70% you know, of them never written about this before. So this is a, a big thing. So I think asking journalists, you know, what, what's your working, you know, you know, intellectually, you know, what are you getting out of your job and what do you need to stay sane? It would be something I'd really like to delve into next. Mm. What about you, Anthony Feinstein? Yeah, those are fantastic questions. For, for me, I think longitudinal data are the most powerful data. So we have the snapshot in a moment in time, but how does this change? How does this change as the story evolves and the pandemic evolves? And so if, even if Mira has the patience to deal with me, <laughs> um, maybe we can go back and even do a follow-up and see you know, what, what, what's happened to our sample. How have they changed six months in or eight months in to the story? What's the evolution of what we've seen? That for me becomes very powerful. Let's do it. Well, That's I hope my you, commitment. Thank you. I, I hope you do because you've taught us so much already. We're going to have to leave it there. But Mira Selva and Anthony Feinstein, thank you for this conversation and thank you for all the information that you've collected to help us. Your study is helpful for so many journalists to know that psychological struggles of covering and living COVID-19 are common and an important reminder that we all need to stay connected and to help each other during these times and to actually say when we need help. So thanks for sharing your insights as we continue to navigate the realities of this pandemic. Thank you all for joining us and for sending in your questions. Dr. Anthony Feinstein's helpful tips are available on the CJF website. And if you want to check out the details of the study of newsroom managers that Mira Salva was talking about, you can find the links at the website as well. Join us in the new year for more J Talks. For updates, you can follow the Canadian Journalism Foundation on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, or just go to the webpage and sign up for the newsletter. The winter uh, is approaching. It's already here for a lot of us. Um, the holidays are approaching. Stay warm, stay safe, look after yourselves, and look after your colleagues too. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.